I wouldn't do very much differently at all, actually, because I think it's incredibly important when you're running a business with 15 or 20 year life cycles of products not actually to be fixated in the short run. And we took a very clear strategy back in 2008 that we wouldn't go down the route of major M&A. We knew we were going to lose a lot of business to generics. In fact, of the 20 billion pounds of revenue that I inherited, about 12 billion disappeared in the first few years to generics. So we've had to replace that and we've now grown to a business of about 25 billion. But we could have done that through a major deal. We didn't because we wanted to focus on organic redesign of our R&D organization and to really try and grow a stronger business rather than continuously look to do deals. Now your cumulative compensation since becoming CEO in 2008 has been in excess of 30 million pounds. It's almost 40 million US dollars. And this is for underperforming uh, many of your rivals. So do you think you've been worth it? Well, first of all, you have to remember I've been CEO for almost 10 years, and it's a little bit disingenuous just to pick a random number out without describing the kind of denominator. If you did that, you'd also see that I am typically paid at the bottom of the range of pharmaceutical CEOs, which is interesting. Uh, and also worth remembering that over that same time period, I've paid more than 40 billion pounds to our shareholders, one of the highest returns to shareholders in the industry, in fact, in any industry. And so when you look at the overall returns to shareholders, look at the overall compensation, I think uh, you know, lots of people will have lots of views about it. What's important is that our compensation is very much performance linked. So in years which have gone well, I've been paid more than in years which have gone badly, which is exactly as it should be. Now you're here in Singapore speaking to a lot of your Asian uh, counterparts, people in other companies. What have they been asking you about Brexit. No change of any rule has taken place and nothing has happened in the real world. Now of course there is a lot of talk and uncertainty and that may have some effect in some parts of the economy but for a company like GSK nothing's changed. So that's really quite important to understand and it's unlikely that anything will change for at least another two or more years until after Article 50 is executed and negotiated. Now, when that process begins and when it concludes, the areas we're most interested in and are most directly impactful to us are basically regulatory. So what will the UK's relationship be with the European Medicine Agency? Will there be a new UK regulator? Will we have more regulation or not? And we don't know yet. And so we're inputting our thoughts and ideas around that. And we'll obviously be looking forward to seeing those specifics come out. And then the second big question, which is the same for everybody, is will we be in the single market in any shape or form or not? We're working on the assumption that we will not, and therefore our preparatory plans are assuming something which is more like a WTO environment with FTAs rather than a continuation of uh, the single market. That might be wrong, but that's our working hypothesis for the moment.